Hey, welcome to the greenhouse. I'm Alex. Today, respiration. Let's go. Respiration is one of many processes that move carbon in the form of carbon dioxide from one place on Earth to another. We track the movement of carbon through the global carbon cycle. We usually think of the carbon cycle as a series of reservoirs, like the biosphere or the atmosphere, that are connected by processes that transfer carbon from one to the other. In the ocean, marine plants take up dissolved carbon dioxide in water to make biomass, and respiration returns it to the water. Carbon also exchanges between seawater and the atmosphere by dissolution and exsolution, and carbon can accumulate over the long term in seafloor sediments and sedimentary rocks. On land, photosynthesis and respiration also cycle carbon between the biosphere and atmosphere, and carbon accumulates in soils as organic matter. These natural cycles run in balance. Photosynthesis removes carbon from the atmosphere, and respiration and decay return exactly the same amount. The input and outputs are equal, and the amount of carbon remains constant in all the reservoirs. When humans get involved, we upset the natural balance. Burning fossil fuels creates a new carbon input to the atmosphere that has no compensating output, so atmospheric carbon accumulates. In order to actually determine if the carbon cycle is in steady state or not, we need to be able to quantify each of the fluxes of carbon and the amounts in each of the reservoirs. For example, when leaves fall in autumn, organisms like fungi and bacteria begin decomposing the leaves, which releases their carbon back to the atmosphere. The sum of respiration and decomposition is a very large carbon flux. These processes reverse photosynthesis, breaking down the carbohydrates and returning carbon from biomass to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. To measure the global respiration and decomposition rate is a big job, but it's not hard to measure respiration from a small area, for example, a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter patch of soil. To do that, we'll use a one liter flux chamber and our laboratory CO2 probe. This is a homemade one liter flux chamber. And since we use this for both our photosynthesis and our respiration experiments, we've got a short how-to video that you can watch to see how to make these chambers yourself. As with some of our other carbon dioxide experiments, we need to get the CO2 probe ready and connect it either to a computer or to a smartphone. And since here I'm gonna run two experiments side by side, so I'm going to connect these both to the computer and collect the data together. For one experiment, we're going to use a clear bottle. And for the second one, we're going to use an opaque bottle wrapped in duct tape. And obviously, the difference is whether or not sunlight is passing into the flux chamber. We're going to measure the respiration taking place in the soil. So I'm going to press these bottles down firmly so that the carbon dioxide doesn't escape and passes right through our CO2 probe. Okay, good to go. Let's collect some data. I'm going to let this run for about five minutes. That should be long enough to get good results. And before we look at the data, think about what's happening here. We're monitoring CO2 over time in two different scenarios, one sunny, one dark. When we graph the data, what do you expect to see? So here's the graph of carbon dioxide concentration in the clear chamber. Looks like there's not much happening here. Does this match the hypothesis you made five minutes ago? Let's look at the data from the dark chamber and see what that tells us. Okay, here we've got carbon dioxide increasing with time. That's certainly what we would expect to see if we've got soil respiration pumping CO2 up into the chamber. So what does that tell us about the clear chamber then? Is there really nothing going on? Or do we have both photosynthesis and respiration happening at the same time so that their effects on carbon dioxide concentration cancel each other out? If you've done our photosynthesis experiment, you've seen that plants are very good at removing CO2 from the atmosphere. That's pretty cool. The data that appear to show the least actually come from the chamber with the most going on. From the data in the dark chamber, we can calculate the rate of carbon dioxide released by soil respiration. We would just need to find the slope of this line. We've now got data that tell us that the carbon cycle, at least in our little chamber, is operating in steady state. Are there other data that we could use to examine a regional or a global signal? The answer is yes. Here are data from a temperate forest. And you can see the daily change in CO2. 
low during the day when plants are photosynthesizing and high at night when respiration takes over. And in fact, we see in these data that the cycle is balanced. It runs in steady state. And that's important to understand. The natural world recycles. Here in the forest, all the leaves have fallen off the trees. They'll decompose, the nutrients will return to the soil, the carbon will return to the atmosphere, and then in the spring, the whole cycle will begin again. The biosphere is in balance. But think about this. What if we, as a human community, behave more like a forest? If we emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we should remove it. And in order to understand if that system is in balance, we need to be able to measure those fluxes to quantify the rate and magnitude of change of natural processes like respiration or decomposition is one of the most important things that a scientist can do. And now you can do it too. <laughs>